today we begin in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. So what we find in these early 
opening verses of chapter 9 is a transition. It is a transition from a comparison, as we saw in chapters really 7 and 8, a comparison of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, with the New Covenant being better, built on better promises. And what we come to today, to begin in chapter 9, is a comparison of the earthly tabernacle and the heavenly tabernacle, and the service or services which occurred in connection with the different tabernacles. Now, what, again, what we will find is a superiority of the heavenly to the earthly. We are speaking of that which is earthly and that which is spiritual or heavenly. The spiritual and heavenly is always superior. The earthly, as we have seen, as we read in the last verse there of chapter 8, is now made obsolete and that which is absolutely elite. He said it's growing old and ready to vanish away. So we don't go back to the Old Covenant, and we don't go back to the Old Tabernacle or the earthly Tabernacle. Now, let me say this as we look at this. When we speak of the earthly Tabernacle, we are speaking of the one built in the wilderness or the desert following Israel's deliverance from Egyptian captivity. Because we need to clarify that because there's more than one temple and more than one tabernacle or more than one uh, time in the scripture that this is mentioned. The temple of Solomon had the what we would call the tabernacle or the, the holy place and the holiest of holies. Uh, the temple or, uh, that we see in uh, Ezra and Nehemiah's day had the same thing. In Herod's day there was one built also that had this. But those were copied off of this one. This is the original. I like to go back to the original. This is what the writer of Hebrews is desiring for his readers to look back to is this tabernacle that was constructed in the wilderness. Now it's interesting. We look at Scripture. <clears throat> things that are of very much importance a lot of time is given to. Now when we look really at the creation of the world, we have three chapters at the beginning. Bible, Genesis 1 through 3. But surprisingly, as I began this study, came to find out in the, in, in the Pentateuch, basically uh, primarily Exodus through Deuteronomy, there are about 50 chapters devoted to the description of the temple and the service which occurred uh, there associated with the temple. This would tell me one thing. God is a God of detail. Details are important. And this is about worship. Now, I announced that my afternoon study is going to be about worship. God is very much concerned about how we worship and how we worship Him. We'll get more into that in our afternoon study. But this lets us know that, that this was not to be to the design of man. This was not left to be left up to man. It wasn't Moses' temple or tabernacle. It wasn't Aaron's tabernacle. It was God's tabernacle. He's the one that gives the design and gives the details concerning that. Now, you know, what you would probably want to do maybe uh, at this point, because we're going to make some references to this, is to go back to Exodus chapter 25. Because it's really in Exodus chapter 25, the birth through chapter 40, that there are many details given about this. We're going to reference some of those. For the Chris read for our scripture this morning, Exodus chapter 40. We're going to go back uh, this eventually. We'll get back to this this morning. I'll make some references to this, but you might want to kind of hold your finger right there uh, because there may be some flipping back and forth between Exodus 25 or in the 20, 26 and 27 and back over to Hebrews chapter 9. Now, when we read these first 15 verses of Hebrews 9, what we see in the first 10 verses of this chapter, it speaks of what? The earthly tabernacle. The one built in the wilderness. When we come down to verse 11, however, and 
beginning and following after there, we find speech concerning the heavenly tabernacle and Christ as our high priest. Look there, emphasis is given in verse 11 there. Uh, there's one made with hands. He says here, but this one is not made with hands, that it is not of this creation. And so, that's what we are comparing. This is what the writer is comparing this morning. Now, the writer says that even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service in the earthly sanctuary. Now, the word here for ordinances means ceremonies. Some places it's it is called ordinances. Some translations have ceremonies. It's interesting when you look at this word in the original language that it is a word that is very closely related to the word for justification. What it speaks of are legal rights. We understand that the, the term justification is a legal pronouncement. It is a legal pronouncement. If we are saved by the grace of God, we have been justified. We have been declared legally righteous before God the Father. That was necessary for us to be able to go to God the Father. Well, in this, what we have, and I believe, I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe that words are just thrown out there and used uh, by chance, especially in the Scripture. But the performance of these ceremonies, and someone had said that this was actually a divine, righteous pronouncement. The performance of these ceremonies was a divine, righteous pronouncement, and it was designed by God and prescribed by God. And when these, before the high priest could go in that one time of year, on the Day of Atonement, which is talked about in Leviticus chapter 16, and speaks there of what Aaron was to do, very specifically was to do. I believe that what is seen in this is in the performance of these ceremonies that it gave Aaron as our high priest, basically we could say the right to come before God. Now he didn't have inherently a right before God. God had said, yes, He's going to be my high priest, but there he's a sinner, and so he has to give a make atonement for himself before he comes into this place. But in following those steps, he gained access to the holiest of all, or the holy of holies, as we might better know it. And on that one day of the year, the day of atonement in Leviticus 16, and through the blood sprinkled on the mercy seat, he provided atonement for the children of Israel. Now, of course, again, we understand this is the time. He is the time. Fulfillment of the time, as we understand, as we'll come through Hebrews chapter 9, as we see in verses 11 and following Christ, is the fulfillment of the time. He is the fulfillment of that. Those services that were performed with the blood and uh, the sprinkling of the blood were the time. They were the type of the fulfillment, which was Christ shedding his blood for the remission of sins. These things are not by accident. This is not just some ceremony that is just thrown out there that God said, well, I think I'll do this. God knew full well what he was doing. He wants us to get the picture. He wants us to look, and I would encourage you to do something. Because we're not going to be finishing this section this week, we're probably going to get to verse 1. Go and read Exodus 25 through 40. And read Leviticus 16. And feel free to read any of the rest of it there <laughs> that has to do with it. Because it will enable you to have a better understanding of what the writer of Hebrews is trying to teach <coughs> these believing <coughs> Hebrews and trying to teach us what God is trying to teach. Oh, it's good to go and to understand the background. People say, well, you know, that's Old Testament. It doesn't really apply to me anymore. It's all the inerrant Word of God. God gave specific instructions, specific design for a reason and for a purpose because there are things that are hidden in these 
ceremonies that are speak of great spiritual truth. We're to understand all of it. We're to, to, to try to discern and to dig into it. John Owen called these ordinances or ceremonies appointments of God. I like that. Appointments of God. They were appointed by God. These ceremonies were appointed by God. The labor, all of these things, the Ark of the Covenant, the, uh, the, 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 the labors that are used, and all of these kind of things, and, and what they had to do, these were all appointments of God. He gave these instructions himself. He is the architect, we would say, very much so, and designer of all of this. God himself. I mean, he is the designer. Who, who would not think that God, who is the designer and architect of all that there is and all of the universe, of every single cell, the DNA that you have in your body uh, that's part of your makeup, is designed, is, is infinitely and specifically created by God. Why would he not, when he is talking about worship of him, why would he not be very concerned that we understand the details? Right. He was. You look back at Exodus chapter 25. You look down there. Look down there to verses 8 and 9. And you look at verse 1. You know, Moses was on the mountain of God in chapter 24. Then in verse 1 of chapter 25, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses. He spoke to Moses. And one of the things that he said when you get down to verses 8 and 9, concerning when he was speaking to Moses, he says, Let them, speaking of the children of Israel, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. Just so. In other words, don't deviate. Don't take from, don't add to. You do it just the way that I say. See, now, let me say this. We all understand that God is omnipresent. God dwells in heaven dwells on earth. But in a very special way during this time, and I think this was for the assurance of the people, he came down to dwell among them of Israel. But God is not just in one place. But he was saying to Moses, and I think this was for their assurance, you make me a tabernacle, I'm going to come here in a special way. It's interesting that when Jesus Christ came to the flesh, it says that he came and he tabernacled among men. He tabernacled among men. God chose to tabernacle among the nation of Israel in a sense at this particular point in time. But he told Moses to do this, and Moses did it just as he said. Moses did not design this. I said, or come up with the idea of it. God gave Moses instruction himself. Now let me say this. Though this is a type and is an earthly tabernacle, the type is important. As I said before, these items and these ordinances speak to the issue of worship. That worship, right? Worship comes by God's design. Sunday afternoon about that, but let me just say this again. Worship is not man's prerogative. It's not to be for the sake of man. It is for the sake of God and the glory of God. We start changing worship to make people happy instead of God happy, if you'll let me use that term happy, then we err. And so by God's desire. And it is not about manpower. And it was not about, in some senses, the word it did benefit the children of Israel. They could see the presence of God with them. But it is about God. Also, in this, when we speak of the early divine service, the earthly tabernacle, it speaks futuristically of the sacrifice 
Christ and the doctrine of justification, that it is alone through the blood of Christ that we are justified. And we remind ourselves of that, that the blood, as we understand, of lambs and goats, those things did not fully atone for the sins of men. That priest, that high priest, Aaron, and those that followed him had to go in there on a yearly basis. Because there was no really, even though it typified and spoke of justification, there was really not an eternal justification. The reason the, the, the new covenant is better is because it's an eternal justification. It is a declaration of God that you and I who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ are eternally justified and right before God. And the one that went to heaven and presented his blood, I believe, is eternal. And he doesn't have to go in and remind God every year, hey, I'm here to present the blood. No, he went in once into the holy place, as we will get into. I have a hard time not getting ahead of myself this morning to get to that because I'm so anxious to get to that that I'm about to bust. <laughs> but he went once, having obtained, as the scripture there says, eternal redemption and having declared us justified for all eternity when he died upon the cross, those that had been saved, those that were saved during that time, those forever that would be saved, they are eternally justified. So even though this is inferior, it does speak to that great doctrine of justification and the forgiveness of sins. That there is no remission of sins, there is no cleansing of sins without the shedding of the blood of Christ. A gospel without the blood is worthless. It is worthless. Those that say that you can attain salvation and justification and eternal sanctification without the blood are false preachers and false prophets. May not mean to be. Some of them do mean to be. But even if they don't mean to be, they're still just as wrong and still just as much preaching heresy yeah. and proclaiming heresy. But the writer here speaks of this, it says worldly, and I think in the King James Version, New King James, it says earthly, which is really, to me, a better translation because you start thinking about worldly, you think about, we start thinking the world, all this, it's wicked things uh, here. But the word used here is cosmicos. Cosmicos. From which we get the word what? Cosmos the word cosmos before. Uh, I think there was a science program or a narrative uh, years out back, uh, years ago, called Cosmos. Uh, unfortunately, the man that hosted the show was not a believer. Talk about the Big Bang. Yes, there was a Big Bang. Bang, God said it, it can't be. Uh, but it means world or earthly. The sanctuary first mentioned here was made, what he means by this simply is that the, the sanctuary first mentioned here was made with human hands, human materials. Like this. <laughs> this building was made with human hands and human materials. Somebody had to build this pulpit. Somebody had to put up these walls and these rafters and do this painting. All sand, sand, all of these things. Some of those that participated in that are here this morning. Some of them has done some of those kind of things. You know, if you've got a house, you, it was built with human hands, out of human materials. But guess what? The human hands that built it, some of those are gone. Any of those are gone. Or will be gone. This place is not going to last forever. Love this place, but we're not to idolize this place. It's a building. It's an earthly building. People want to, you know, and we sometimes, and I've said this before, we call it a sanctuary, but we'll refer to it. 
It's only a sanctuary for God's people. God is here with us, worshiping together. His presence is here. It is that sanctuary. And that was the thing that made this place a sanctuary. It was where God was there. God was present there. But the one, of course, as we said in verse 11, as it says there, is contrast with the verse 11. It's not made earthly hand, not of this creation. But even though it is inferior to the heavenly tabernacle, it is still very important. In case some of you don't know, John Owen was a great Puritan preacher. There was one quote that he made in here that I really wanted, wanted you to hear, so I'm, I'm going to quote it. I always want to give credit for credit to you when somebody makes a quote. I don't ever want to take credit for a quote that I didn't make. As soon as I read it, you would know, well, that didn't come out of your mind. It was brilliant to him, God. But he said this This tabernacle was a visible pledge of the presence of God among the people, only blessing and protecting me. He was also the pledge and means of God's residence amongst them. And it was the fixed seat of divine worship, wherein the truth and purity of it were to be preserved. It was also a continual representation of the incarnation of the Son of God, a type of His coming in the flesh to dwell among them and by the one sacrifice of himself to make reconciliation with God and atonement for sins. Amen. That's all I can say to that. That's what it represented. That's what it speaks of. This is what all of this speaks of is Christ. Christ. And the one thing, I, and there was one thing I wanted to note here, one other thing that is important about looking at this time that I think is important that one thing of note about the dimensions and design of the tabernacle, the surrounding courtyard. It's about 150 feet long, about 75 feet wide. And it had one single gate. It's about 30 feet wide, seven and a half feet tall. There were not several ways into the tabernacle. only one way. There are not many ways to God the Father. There's only one way to God the Father. That is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself, he was here on earth, and there are many scriptures that I could turn to and speak of this morning, but there's a couple that I want to speak of. Today. John 14, 6, Five and six, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going and how do we know the way. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Turn back a few pages to John chapter 10. There in verses 7 through 9. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, or truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All whoever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out by the next sheep. It is only through Christ. You want the gospel? Christ is the way. Christ is the way to God the Father. You want to know the way to heaven? It is through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to go to heaven, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You repent of your sins and call on Him. He is the way. And the tabernacle pointed to the way. And the apostles understood this. They knew this because you find in Acts chapter 4 and there in verse 12 when he was speaking of Christ, Peter said this, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, 
who you crucified, whom God raised from the dead by him, this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. stone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. None. So what does the tabernacle, the ordinances that are associated with, speak of? It speaks of Jesus Christ and Him crucified and His shed blood. It speaks of justification that we're declared righteous through Him. It speaks of Him as the high priest. He is our intercessor, but there is no intercessor apart from Jesus Christ. It speaks of the necessity of death in one. And it speaks also of the judgment of God. Because the shedding of blood, the death that occurs, without that, there's judgment. Apart from the blood, there's judgment. So as we proceed through this particular passage, because I have much more to say, and I do not want to start into a section where I don't have sufficient time, we're going to stop there this morning. There's much more to say, much more to be believed. And I do hope that you will participate in this by reading the scriptures. Don't just take what your pastor has to say. Be as Bereans who search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. Thank you. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you this morning for all the scripture. And may we see in our study in Hebrews chapter 9, may we see have our eyes open to great truths. Father, we, we want to understand your true form. May we grow in your truth. And Father, may as we grow in your truth, may we be better equipped to give an answer to every man the hope that is within us. And may we, Father, be better witnesses. May we be more conformed to Christ and less 